Dr. Bonas is the managing director of the Natural Gas Initiative here at Stanford. And uh, she has been at Stanford now for a couple of years. Before this, she was uh, in technical and management roles at Chevron for many, many years. And uh, I'd love to hear from uh, Naomi and to hear what NGI is doing in the area of research and what opportunities there are for uh, folks who are interested in this area to get involved. Naomi, it's over to you. Thank you. Well, welcome to Stanford, everybody. I know this isn't the, uh, the experience you were hoping for, but we are thrilled to have you. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Uh, you know, Professor Dion is a tough act to follow, but I am not gonna be uh, talking about a specific technical project, but rather I am gonna um, kind of zoom um, out and talk to you about the role of natural gas in the energy landscape. So I'm pretty sure that yesterday you heard from both Sally Benson, Chris Field and others probably about the global energy and environmental challenge. One of the things I love about the uh, Stanford energy uh, community is that we really try and look at this problem in a holistic way and uh, you know trying to provide almost a, twice as much energy for the growing population uh, that's accessible, affordable, secure, while we protect the planet. What a challenge. And uh, natural gas has a role to play in that. Uh, I know most of you uh, are probably coming to Stanford to work on, uh, you know, 100% carbon free solutions. So for the next 30 minutes, I just want you to keep an open mind about the role that natural gas has to play and, and indeed the, the um, fossil fuel companies, they uh, you know, have many um, issues that I know we're all aware of, but I really think that in order for us to solve some of the big um, decarbonization goals, they have to play a role. So I'm gonna talk to you um, about a few things. Uh, the first is really around how we have such an abundance of natural gas. And that provides immediate opportunities for decarbonization. And, you know, in the US, we are very focused on decarbonization. And that is the luxury that we have because we have access to energy. That is not the case across the world. And certainly in the developing world, uh, there's a huge role um, for natural gas to improve the quality of life uh, for millions of people. So I'm going to or billions of people actually. Uh, so I'm gonna talk specifically um, about the role of um, natural gas for thermal fuels and um, a little bit about how natural gas is going to or is starting to interplay with renewables, both in developing economies and in places like California where we are rapidly decarbonizing. Where, why do I think that um, gas is going to continue to play a role for a long time? And finally, I want to um, emphasize that, you know, the oil and gas industry has a major role to play. And I'm going to talk about some of the um, technical um, issues around uh, reaching CO2 emissions reductions that I think the oil and gas industry are really the only players in the room that have um, the means to do it at the scale necessary. So, uh, you know, hopefully you haven't been living under a rock and you know that in the United States, we've had this um, huge acceleration and uptick in the amount of natural gas that is being produced. So the graph on the right shows the natural gas production, pr production in um, uh, barrels per day as, as a function of time. And, and it's, uh, you know, primarily um, in the Permian um, and the Marcellus, but um, certainly across the country, we're seeing this huge natural gas production uptick. And that directly correlates with a reduction in CO2 emissions. And hopefully yesterday uh, you touched base on this a little bit and know that uh, natural gas is responsible for displacing coal. So the graph on the left shows the US coal production. Uh, the black dots are the data points. And the red is where we were headed before natural gas became available to displace it, uh, primarily in power plants. And the plot on the right is some work from uh, Professor Kopchek's group, who works with uh, my program, the Natural Gas Initiative, looking at the avoided CO2 emissions um, if you look at using natural gas with um, CCS, with renewables, and how that all plays out. 
And we're talking about gigatons of avoided CO2 emissions. So we know that fuel switching from coal to natural gas works. And in the US, we've been really successful at doing this. But elsewhere, there is still a lot of coal production. So the plot on the left shows the projected um, coal production. And you can see that it is expected to increase substantially in the next 20 years or so, mostly um, in China and India and mostly because of the, um, the cost fa factor. So coal is uh, locally available and very affordable. So right now in Asia, there's currently about 300 gigawatts of coal generation capacity power plants under construction. And that's roughly what we have left in the United States right now. So this is a very serious issue because coal provides about 38% of global power, but it's responsible for 75% of the emissions. So anything we can do to displace coal is a good thing. So how do we make natural gas cheaper than coal? So one of the things um, that we work on in the Natural Gas Initiative is looking at things like carbon pricing. Uh, there are you know, a number of different um, philosophies on how you could implement a carbon price, whether it's a tax or a cap and, cap and trade. Uh, this is some work from um, Mark Thurber, who is in the School of Economics, um, and shows that even at a very sort of reasonable carbon price of about 25, 20 to $25 per ton of CO2, gas plants start looking um, as attractive, if not more attractive, than coal plants. And the uh, the plot on the right, I don't expect you to read all the numbers, but just to show you that uh, this is all of the uh, current carbon pricing schemes that are currently in effect throughout the world. So there's about 50 countries or states or territories um, where there is some kind of um, carbon uh, pricing scheme. So the, the, um, the y-axis here is the carbon price um, and the um, x-axis is the uh, volume or the percentage of the uh, carbon that is being uh, addressed through the pricing scheme. And this was from a, a 2020 World Bank study. So we are looking at doing this, but you know, again, in the United States and in other um, developed countries, we have the luxury of thinking about um, decarbonization as our, our primary um, target. But of course, that's not true um, throughout the world. And energy poverty is a reality. I'm sure many of you have um, traveled to countries where you've seen this firsthand. And for me, it's um, unacceptable that we live in a world where, uh, you know, in places like the United States, we're, um, we're squandering energy. And then there are people who are living in um, absolute poverty. And of course, energy demand is only going to increase. So um, this is a map showing uh, how energy demand will change um, between 2016 and 2040. And so you can see the United States, Europe, and Japan are expected to reduce uh, their energy uh, demand, but the rest of the world is greatly going to increase. So of course, um, Africa and India and China in particular um, are on our minds when we think about um, energy access and changing energy demands. And we know that uh, wealthy countries have access to energy. That's just a fact. So there are still um, upwards of uh, a billion people without access to electricity. Uh, so in places like India, great um, strides have been made. So now if you look at access to India, uh, uh, electricity in India, uh, what you see is that actually 100% of the country has access. But of course, that means that you, your village might have access and you would have access if you had the means to pay for it. So even though, you know, we have to be careful about how we think of this and how we measure it. Um, having access doesn't mean that you actually have electricity because it's a function of whether or not you can afford it. Um, but nevertheless, India has made great uh, strides. Um, 
China has made um, great strides, but Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the big yellow bar at the bottom here, uh, is uh, in a ever worsening state actually. So uh, in Africa, the situation really hasn't improved. We know that one in two people that are gonna be added to the world's population in the next 30 years are in Africa. And there really hasn't been a lot of uh, great progress um, on the electricity front. So that's something that we um, are working on actively in the Natural Gas Initiative to uh, come up with innovative ways to um, solve um, some of these um, energy issues. So I think it's really interesting what's happening in um, India. And I just wanted to take a, a moment um, to talk about the interplay between gas and renewables. So um, in India, I'm sure many of you know, um, renewables are set to generate almost 50%, I think, what does I say, 44% of all the electricity um, by 2030. That's remarkable, right? Because in California, we're at something like 35%. So they've really kind of um, embraced the uh, renewable energy transition. But uh, in order for them to have reliable electricity, and uh, typically that's measured um, as a function of um, reliability as a percentage. So 99.97% is a kind of standard number. That's the reliability of um, uh, electricity in developed countries. They need 12 hours of storage, which is gonna cost $675 billion. So that's a quarter of India's GDP. And so their government has actively embraced gas as kind of the, the backup for renewables, if you will, the reliable backup that allows for um, energy electricity to be continuous because unreliable energy, you know, if you look at places like Pakistan, they have, um, they have electricity, it's 100% access almost, uh, but it's very unreliable and it has absolutely crippled their economy. Their manufacturing and um, industrial sectors in particular uh, suffer greatly because of the uh, reliability factor. So India is thinking ahead about this and they now have a target for 15% natural gas consumption by 2030. And they're investing 60 billion on gas infrastructure, which when you think about it, it's kind of a, a drop in the ocean compared to the $675 billion that you'd have to um, invest in storage uh, to go along with the, um, the high renewable share. Uh, the graph in the bottom just shows the, um, the increasing imports um, of liquefied natural gas. So um, India receives a lot of um, imports, uh, mostly from Qatar because of the uh, the close distance, um, but certainly uh, as the United States begins doing more imports, um, some of those will also be going to India. So we talked a little bit about um, electricity and I want to also um, talk about cooking fuels. So the number of people without electricity is around a billion. There's almost three billion more people, or many of them are the same people, I guess it's kind of a an overlapping Venn diagram, uh, that require clean thermal fuels. So they're using wood and biomass um, and 4 million people die every year from this type of indoor air pollution associated with cooking. So, I mean, I was shocked when I heard this number and to put it in perspective, that's more than AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis combined. And again, uh, the, the graph on the right kind of shows the breakdown of where this is the main issue. Um, India uh, is actually doing much better now. So this was uh, data from the last um, study that the IEA did on this in 2017. In the last uh, few years, um, India has put in government run subsidies to get um, uh, LPG propane tanks, uh, just like the ones you use for your barbecues um, to people in India. And, and this has really kind of been a successful um, uh, program that has really, really sort of changed the, um, the death rate in India associated with indoor air pollution. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa um, and Southeast Asia uh, remain concerning and, and certainly in Africa, as, again, as the population is increasing um, and no real 
um, solutions are being put in place, it becomes um, even more of a concern. So in my program, we kind of look um, at, at this in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And, you know, it's very easy to sort of jump straight to the bottom picture, which is this huge um, LNG import facility. It probably costs $10 billion um, of capital investment to put in place. It requires the cooperation of uh, countries, governments, companies, um, and, and is very, it's got a very long time frame. But some of the most successful programs in addressing some of these issues are actually at a much smaller scale. So uh, I mentioned the, um, the government subsidy uh, program in India, as uh, picture on the left there of this guy delivering the propane tanks on his motorcycle. And um, we've also done some work with um, some really kind of interesting entrepreneurial companies in Africa that are, uh, uh, they have a pay as you go propane tank system um, that they deliver out to villages. Uh, so that's a, a picture from, uh, this is B-Box, uh, but there's actually a number of, of companies that are now doing that that's very successful. So, you know, I think keeping an open mind, and, and the reason I'm, I wanted to mention this is I think you're, you know, looking for projects and companies that you want to get involved with. I think scale matters, and sometimes the best solutions are at the smaller scale. So thinking about these problems in different ways is, is really important. All right, so that's a little bit about the developing world. So let's, uh, let's jump back to California. And I, I just want to sort of highlight the, um, the main issue on the table here. So here's a timeline of California policies for greenhouse gas reductions. So nobody is disputing that, you know, this is a great set of goals um, and, and we need to have uh, goals and targets. So I think up to about 2035, for me, it all makes sense, right? We've got, you know, a 60% renewables goal. Um, we've got a target for about 5 million electric vehicles. I'm like, okay, you know, this all seems manageable. But it's what happens after 2035 that I think is uh, concerning. So we now have SB100, which is 100% um, zero carbon electricity goal by 2045. So I, I and many, many people at Stanford, this is the space that we're working in because it is unclear how we're going to meet these goals. So having goals is one thing, but the pathways to get there are um, unclear right now. And we need to be explicit in how we're going to meet these goals. I mentioned the cost of storage in India um, for renewables. Well, that's also true here. So we could not afford um, as a um, state to move to 100% renewables um, and expect everyone in our state to still have access to energy. And so those issues around affordability and social equity um, are really emphasized here. And, and to put this in further perspective, right, we're, you know, I, th I think about the, um, I've been thinking about the electric car um, evolution um, and 5 million EVs roughly requires doubling the electricity from our energy supply. And, and roughly about 70% of our energy comes from natural gas. So we're talking about, you know, moving to higher shares of renewables whilst increasing the overall output of our electrical supply system. And if we now talk about 2050, goals of around 15 million um, electric vehicles, that's quadrupling our current energy supply from the electricity grid. So these are very real problems that need to be solved. And one of the things that um, my program and pre-court and others have been working on is um, looking at hydrogen to um, solve some of these issues. And, you know, it's really interesting. So I've worked at Chevron for many years and uh, back in like the, I don't know, 2000, something like that, hydrogen was the latest fad and everybody had research centers set up around it. And then it died a quick death when the oil price dropped. And it's kind of made this resurgence and I think many of us feel that it's different this time because we now have a clear vision of how hydrogen could help us. I think back in 2000, we were like, oh, hydrogen seems interesting. Like, I'm sure we can figure out a way to use this, but we didn't really understand what 
role it was able or um, going to play. And now we do, right? So um, particularly for heavy duty transportation, um, hydrogen has uh, some really uh, interesting um, and exciting prospects. And of course, you know, the Natural Gas Initiative is so involved with this because right now 70% of hydrogen is made from natural gas. So we're looking at ways to make that 100% um, carbon free um, using um, carbon capture and storage and other techniques. Um, I'm a co-instructor for the Stanford Hydrogen Seminar class in the winter, so I'll put in a plug for that. Uh, I co-instruct that with uh, Sally Benson and Jimmy Chen from um, Precourt. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's lots of, uh, I think, pathways uh, within this that are going to become more and more important. So, you know, for the foreseeable future, um, oil and coal remain um, ab about the same and new energy. Uh, so from the increasing population and increasing energy demand in general, it's going to come from renewables and gas. So gas is around um, to stay and it's our job uh, to make sure that it is um, as clean as it can possibly be and, and that we consider, you know, the future and how we're going to eventually um, phase it out as uh, carbon, um, f completely carbon free technologies um, come around. But, you know, no doubt that uh, gas is going to be around for the, um, for the long term. So one of the things that I think is really important is uh, if we're going to be using gas, let's do it um, as clean as we possibly can. And there's been a lot in the press um, over the last five years, I would say it's really kind of increased around methane emissions. Um, we, we have a big team. It's one of our biggest focus areas um, in the Natural Gas Initiative looking at how we can better detect um, methane emissions using a variety of technologies. We have some papers that we've written on using airplane um, uh, detection uh, methodologies and how we can mitigate it. How can we um, ensure that we are limiting uh, the release of methane as much as possible? But given that we are, you know, in this world where we have increasing um, emissions, I really, you know, want to um, emphasize that I think we need to work with the fossil fuel industries, the oil and gas companies. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, carbon capture and storage. So this is a graph that shows the amount of carbon dioxide in gigatons that would have to be captured and stored in order to achieve the two degree Paris Accord scenario. Uh, and it's broken down into, um, you know, various sectors, power industry and other, but that's uh, sort of irrelevant. So right now, uh, we capture and store globally about 30 megatons a year. So this is a gigaton scale, so it doesn't show up. It is minuscule, but the technology exists. I worked on a proje project at Chevron where we uh, captured carbon um, in a depleted um, saline aquifer, it, it, it is completely doable. Now, what we, what we want to aim for in the next 10 years is being able to um, capture somewhere around three gigatons. And it turns out that three gigatons of, um, that's three gigatons a year of carbon dioxide is roughly equivalent to the volume uh, that is extracted uh, in global oil production. So it's about 30 billion barrels a year. So in my mind, there's this huge opportunity as we produce oil and gas to fill the um, depleted reservoirs with carbon dioxide as a means to um, reduce uh, the carbon that's being emitted into the atmosphere until we get to the point where, you know, maybe some of these um, uh, negative carbon uh, technologies that are people are working on um, are developed. In the short term, I really believe that this CCS is really the only realistic option uh, for meeting our two degree scenario. And, you know, I'll tell you why. So the oil and gas industry has a lot of existing knowledge of the subsurface. We already have these reservoirs mapped out. Much of the infrastructure is already in place. It's actually relatively simple to take a, an old oil and gas well and turn it into a carbon dioxide um, well. 
and we have the pore space to accommodate these huge volumes and it's been done safely and effectively um, for many, many years. Uh, there's also the upside, you know, the oil and gas uh, industry, as much as we wish they were altruistic or not. Uh, so they, they have the potential for um, improving their production by injecting the carbon dioxide to push out the oil and gas. So this is just one of the, the things that we're um, working on. I just want to say a couple of words about my program. So the Natural Gas Initiative, we have about 40 research groups from Stanford. Um, they range from uh, nuts and bolts science and engineering through to business, economics and policy. Um, and then we have a consortium of industry partners. All of this is on um, the website. So you can just uh, go to ngi.stanford.edu if you want any more information. So we have seven um, focus areas. Um, again, they range from, um, you know, chemistry um, and science and engineering through to global markets and governance. And, um, and we hold um, a number of events. This year, it was a little light. Obviously, we had a lot of uh, postponing happening with um, COVID, but we're now planning um, a few different events for next year focused on um, methane detection, flaring solutions, energy access, hydrogen, uh, and usually we have about 10 events a year and you are all welcome. So it's invitation only, uh, but feel free to reach out to me anytime. And, uh, you know, I guess with that, I know it's tough to engage with uh, the community when it's in this uh, COVID, you know, virtual world, but I'm always open to having a Zoom chat or uh, touching base. I've worked with lots of students on specific projects, but also just if you want to, uh, you know, have a coffee chat about the energy landscape. I am always happy to do that. So I will pause and maybe we have a few minutes for quick questions. Folks, we have time for a couple of questions if uh, people would like to raise their hand. Uh, Catherine Werner has a question. Catherine, go ahead, please. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Learned a lot. Um, you, so at the end, when you're talking about carbon capture and sequestration, obviously this will have a lot of cost. Um, can you speak at all as what you think are the most promising ways um, to finance that and, you know, get That's a get great that question. Going? Yeah, I can. So the, um, there is a, a uh, initiative called the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, and all of the big oil companies have committed uh, $10 million to that fund. So that um, organization is actively seeking uh, carbon capture um, uh, and storage technologies. They, they are looking at investing in small companies. Um, Stanford it has a um, carbon capture and storage initiative uh, and is actively working with um, a couple of oil companies. I don't think I'm at liberty to say which ones yet, but um, on specific projects, because it's obviously, you know, the oil and gas industry is going to have to reinvent itself. And my, you know, I worked at Chevron for many years and I understand the industry, but uh, my uh, greatest hope is that they move from being, you know, the evil fossil fuel producers to being the, um, you know, uh, climate carbon sequesters, right? That, that I mean, it, and it's really the only option on the table that could be done at scale and in the short time frame that's necessary. We need to move on this in the next 10 years, right? So I'm not suggesting that this is the only thing that we should be working on, but it is the only thing right now uh, that can move forward and everybody sees that. So I think funding uh, through um, programs like OGCI is only going to increase. Thank you. We have one more minute for a question okay. by Matt. Matt, go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. This is gonna be a tough question to answer in a minute. Um, okay. But I guess I, I find one of the difficulties when discussing natural gas and renewables tied together is that the conversation tends to drift to either no renewables are the solution or no oil and gas is the solution. Yes. So how, in your opinion, what's the way to kind of bridge the gap in that conversation um, to, to kind of allow those two sides to come together? Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's a very... Um, charged conversation right so people on both sides feel like they're fighting for everything and and, and i think for me uh you know when i talk to uh state legislators um i just adopt a really pragmatic approach to this right and we you know that that diagram that shows um 
uh, the, the different things that we're trying to balance, right? So we've got uh, the environment, national security, affordability, um, I'm missing one, but uh, you know, I think uh, helping people think through that is really important. You know, and we live in a very privileged world where everybody is just assuming that when they flick the light switch, it'll continue to work. And right now we are not in a position where we can do that with 100% renewables. So we have to think about this like in a more nuanced way. So certainly, you know, one of the reasons that NGI was set up was to try and have that uh, unbiased, uh, you know, scientifically based perspective, right? So that we're not, you know, biased one way or the other, but this is, you know, what the science is telling us that we need to have a gradual transition in order to manage all of those competing factors.